Well, this morning we're coming, as I've already mentioned, to the Sixth Commandment. You shall not murder. And there I've just read the text, so that's uh, what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be considering again, as I've said before, how we might love God by protecting His image. And we understand that from the context of this particular commandment. Man is the image of God. That is what really all of us are. That is the way the Lord has made us. We're going to look just briefly at what that actually means, but we do need to understand that since we are the image of God, we need to protect life, our lives. We need to protect the lives of others and not take life away unjustly. Now, last week, uh, we, we saw that we are to love God uh, by spending His, His day with Him. Uh, that is the first day of the week, uh, the day in which uh, our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the day of His resurrection, which is in the Bible called the Lord's Day, but which, as we tie to the fourth commandment, because that's what the Lord does, as we saw last week, tie this to the fourth commandment, we might call the Christian Sabbath. And what sets it apart, of course, is what we're commemorating on this day versus what was commemorated in the work of, well, in the first or the old covenant Sabbath, which was, first of all, the creation of the world, and then it was the deliverance of God's people out of Egypt. That was the old covenant. And in the, the new covenant, we are commemorating the resurrection of our Lord. This is the day he rose again from the dead. Now, as we saw, he gave us this day to be a blessing to us. Sabbath is a picture of heaven. It's a promise that the Lord holds out to us every week of what is ahead of us. It's a spiritual oasis to refresh us along the way. We, we need these things to encourage us and to strengthen us. We need a day when we can focus on Him, set everything else aside, and gain from Him the strength that we need to do what He calls us to do, which is to love Him and to walk with Him the rest of the week. Now, we also saw that this day can serve us in another way. It's one way that we can see our spiritual health, our spiritual condition much more clearly. If we enjoy this day, if we enjoy doing what the Lord calls us to do, which is taking a break from our work, that is, the unnecessary work. There are things that have to be done today. We don't take a break from those things. And, and we can take a break from the things in the world that throughout the week are distracting us from God, and we want to spend this time with Him and with each other. If we can do that and enjoy that, then we know that we will also enjoy the time when every day is going to be just like this day, when we will finally enter into our, our Lord's rest, the rest that our Lord Jesus Christ entered into after He rose from the dead in heaven, that eternal day above. See, if we can enjoy this day, we know we're going to enjoy heaven because that's what, this is what heaven is like, you see, on this day. And on the flip side of that, if we don't enjoy it, then we really can't believe that we're going to enjoy it up there. We need to make sure we understand what heaven is and what it isn't. It's not a place where we do all the things we enjoy in this world, where we fish and catch the biggest fish, where we play basketball and always win football and we're the superstar and so forth. That's how a lot of people picture heaven. But that's not what it is. This is really what heaven is all about, worshiping the Lord, rejoicing in Him, loving Him in this way. So this is what heaven, heaven is like. Do you enjoy it? Do you love it? Well, then you'll love the heaven that is above. We, we do have, of course, greater things waiting for us in heaven. We will have that clear view of God. We will see the Lord Jesus Christ seated at His right hand. We will be blessed beyond measure in the fellowship of the angels and the saints. But this is a picture of what is going on there. And God is very much present here as He is there. He just reveals Himself differently there for our pleasure, for our enjoyment. Now the Sabbath also reminds us what every day should be like, how we are really to live each day, each moment in His presence, to walk with Him in His Spirit, to devote ourselves to Him every day, enjoying Him, glorifying Him by reflecting His character and by telling other people what He has done so that they might be saved. 
In a certain sense, the Sabbath is like a tithe, although we wouldn't want to use the word tithe because tithe means tenth. It's really like a seventh. It's a tithe of our time that recognizes that everything, all of our time belongs to the Lord and should be used for His glory. When we set aside this time exclusively for Him, it reminds us that our whole lives actually belong to Him. Now, how can we do that? How can we enjoy this day as we should? Well, the Spirit of God has already taken care of that. He has made us new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made it so this, we want to do this. We want to spend this day with Him. It's the only thing that will satisfy us. As a matter of fact, He's made it so we want to spend every day with Him. To live as He calls us to live, to love as He calls us to love, because that is our new nature. That is what the Spirit of God has done within us, giving us these holy desires. Now, we also saw last week that our love for God will express itself in respecting the authority that He has ordained in the home, in the church, in the state, and in our workplace. Another thing the Spirit of God does in the work of the new creation is He shows us that that these things which formerly we may have resented when we were outside of Christ were actually ordained by God for our good as shepherds oh, watching over us, protecting us, and caring for us. It's many of the different ways that God actually provides for us and the lack of any of these things would actually uh, harm us. He gives us the ability not only to see that but also to uh, respect it and submit to it in the same way that Jesus did and for the same reason because it was ordained by his father for his good he also gives us the ability to use authority if he has given us authority in any one of these spheres if it has been entrusted to us by him to use it just as Jesus used his not to make others serve us but that we might serve others, even as Jesus became a servant to us for our salvation, even as the angels who are greater in power and authority use that power and authority to serve us, so leaders in the home, church, and state are to do the same, and even that authority that comes from being an employer over an employee. Jesus is our perfect example. He submitted to every sphere of authority because he knew his Father had established it. Now this morning we're going to look at another way that we can show our love to Him. And that is by protecting His image. By being careful to preserve life. What I'd like to do is look at three things. First of all, what the Lord tells us in the Sixth Commandment. What is He actually saying? What do the words mean? Secondly, why He wants us to do this. And then thirdly, how we are to apply this commandment beyond the meaning, the bare meaning of the words. In other words, the, the broader application. So first of all, what does the Lord require in this command? You shall not murder, Exodus 20, verse 13. Well, to summarize it, we can put it this way. He tells us that we may not take away life unjustly. Now, he doesn't mean that it's wrong to take away any kind of life. He says, you shall not murder, but he is talking about a specific kind of life and not just life in general. It's not wrong to take away any kind of life. And I say this only because we have so many movements today that are opposed to the taking away of the life of animals, right? Protecting animal rights. Well, animals do have certain rights, according to the Word of God, but there are certain rights they don't have. For one thing, they may not object to our using them in the way that the Lord intends for us to use them. God has actually given us the right to use animals for food. You know that's true. I mean, how many times do you have meat on the table? Where do you suppose that meat came from? It came from the animals. And there's nothing wrong with that. After the flood, the Lord said to Noah in Genesis 9 verse 3, Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. 
Now, I do want you to know, uh, to bear in mind here that this is not a blanket statement to go out and destroy every animal that you see, and I hope you don't have that desire anyway. God is not saying that we can destroy His creatures for any reason to kill them merely for the pleasure of doing so, but we may use them for food, and we may use them to make clothing. Uh, there's also a lot of dangerous animals out there, and we can eliminate those if they present a danger to us, or if they're destructive to our livelihood. You know how crows like to get in the field and eat corn? Well, you can, you know, you can destroy those crows. You can put poison out there. You can put scarecrows to scare them away because they destroy our livelihood. But we may not eliminate them to the point of extinction. We need to take care of the creation. And by the way, the same thing holds true of insects. If they're destructive, if they present a danger to our health or our life, we may also remove them. You know, flies or uh, mosquitoes. We, we all, I think we all particularly like mosquitoes, don't we? Uh, they can be dangerous because they can carry disease. And so we do actually eliminate them in large quantities for that reason. And there is nothing in this commandment that would forbid us from so doing. What the Lord is specifically targeting here is the unjust taking away, of course, of human Life. Now, I want you to notice that I use the word unjust because it isn't always unjust to take a man's life. God has given, and let me give you several examples of the exceptions. God has given the power of the sword, the power to execute to the magistrate, or in our case, the magistrates, uh, leaders of state, federal government, state government, local government, and so forth. Paul writes in Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. God has given the power of the sword or the power to execute to the government. Now, the Lord tells us that there are several crimes that actually deserve capital punishment, one of which we've already looked at in our meditation and we'll come back to in a few moments. In these cases where somebody unjustly takes the life of another, Elite, well, and there's other cases. The magistrate is authorized by God to use the sword to execute. Now, the magistrate may also use the sword to protect us against foreign invaders. And sometimes we even have to do battle on foreign soil to protect our own people from foreign invaders. This is what they, basically, this is what the government does through our military. That's why we have a military, to protect us. And this is also why we as believers may serve in the military and shouldn't hesitate to use the sword against those who are unjustly trying to kill us or enslave us and our neighbors if the magistrate calls us to do so. So if we're in the military, we have a gun, we're out on the field, we can shoot the gun against the enemy if it's a just war and we can kill the enemy who is trying to unjustly take away our lives. That settles the, the issue of, you know, the idea of conscientious objection. And there may be conscientious objection if the battle that the magistrate is sending us to fight is not a just battle. If we lived in a, in a country that was tyrannical and liked to swallow up other countries and steal their resources, to fight in such an army would not be just. Of course, again, if they use the sword for an unjust cause, we have to disobey. But if for a just cause, we may use it. Now, the magistrate may also use the sword to protect us within the state, within the country in which we live, or within the city, which is why we have a police force and why we may also serve as police if the Lord should call us to do so and use the power of the sword to stop those trying to kill us or other people. Now, the Lord further tells us that we may protect our own lives and the lives of our neighbors from anyone who would try to take away our lives or their lives unjustly, that we may even use lethal force. We might even say 
This is the power of the sword that is entrusted to us through, through the government, through the magistrate, and it is a right that is guaranteed to us by our Constitution that we can use lethal force to stop someone even if we're not a member of the military, even if we are not a member of the police. We have the right to bear arms and to protect our lives and our property. But again, let's not miss the point of this. Even though there are exceptions to the rule, and the rule is we are to um, love the Lord and our neighbor uh, by not unjustly taking away life, there are exceptions, but this is the rule. Protect life. Protect your own life. Protect the lives of others. Now, secondly, why does the Lord want us to protect our lives and the lives of others? Well, it's because of what I said before. It's because we are His image. After giving Noah and his family permission to eat the animals, which is what we just looked at a few moments ago, he then says this in Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, which we read for our meditation. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood... By man, his blood shall be shed. And again, this is the grounds of, for all the exceptions we just looked at. For in the image of God, he made man. That is the reason why the exceptions exist and why sometimes life must be taken and why it should also be protected. If anyone or anything unjustly kills a man, whether the one who does it or the thing that does it is a man or an animal, he is to be executed. And the reason is because it is a terrible crime to destroy God's image. You see, man's value, his intrinsic value, is tied to the fact that he bears the image of God. Now, that was true before the fall, the Lord said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And if you were there on Wednesday evening and saw or heard what Sinclair Ferguson had to say, he reminded us that when God says let us make man, it wasn't God and the angels, you know, it wasn't God speaking to the angels, but it was the Father speaking to the Son and the Spirit. The Father speaks, the word he speaks is the eternal Logos, the Son of God, and the Spirit who is hovering over the waters is the one who is carrying out that creative act. And then as God is creating, he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In other words, what we are is the result of that. We are in God's image. We are made according to his likeness. Now, that applied not only before the fall, but it also applied after the fall. When God said to Noah in Genesis 9, 6, or what he said about the penalty for taking a life that we just read a few moments ago, he said, after the fall. So man is still the image of God. And James also writes in James 3, verses 8 and 9, the same thing. He says, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Now, James is recognizing that men are still in the likeness of God. Mankind still bears God's image. I told you I was going to tell you what that means. We bear His image not physically, God doesn't have a body. He's not a physical being. We've never, you know, born his image physically. It's, it's not what we see that God is talking about here. God is a spirit. We bear his, his image spiritually. And what that means is we can think. We are aware of the fact that we exist. You know, we have purpose, the ability to do things, to desire things. We are immortal. Only because God makes us immortal, we will never cease to exist. Even if we die in this world, our spirit continues in one of two places, as we know. And we are still moral creatures. That is, we have a capacity to be moral, something the animals do not have. That sets us apart from 
the animals. Now, fallen man still is a moral creature. He still has a capacity to be moral, but apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, he is morally corrupt. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his moral image, that love for what is good and right, is something the Lord restores in us, and so we become even more of the image of God. But because man bears God's image, he is to be protected. We are to protect others, and we are to protect ourselves from being unjustly killed. Well, let's consider finally how we are to love God and our neighbor in protecting his image. Now, the Pharisees believed that if they didn't take away a life unjustly, that they had kept this law. They had loved God and their neighbor as God required. But we know that that's far from true. That's what Jesus was pointing to in the text we read for our reading of his law. And in the same way, there is still more here for us to do if we are to love as the Lord calls us to love. Now, first of all, we've seen we must not take away life, but we must also preserve life. There's more involved here than merely protecting ourselves or our neighbor from those who try to kill us. We need to protect ourselves and others from anything that might actually harm us, even from the things that we do to harm ourselves. And there's a lot of things like that. Let me give you some examples. If we have bad eating habits, if we eat things that aren't good for us, if we eat too many things that aren't good for us or just too much food in general, if we allow ourselves to get out of shape or in a physically weak condition, if we drink too much alcohol, if we take illegal drugs, if we develop a smoking habit, smoking has been proven to be very bad for your health. If we continually put ourselves under situations that are just so stressful that they, they destroy our health. If we engage in activities that are too risky, you know, we'd have to determine how risky they are and, and decide whether or not that's something we should take up. Is, is skydiving a good idea? Cliff climbing without any supporting ropes to catch you if you fall? Some forms of bungee jumping are rather severe, extreme, we might call what they, you know, extreme I think is the word that's used for just about everything today. But if we do things that put our lives at unnecessary risk, we're not loving ourselves as the Lord calls us to. We're not protecting ourselves. We're doing things that could possibly shorten our lives for what reason? So we can get a thrill, an adrenaline rush. The Lord is telling us that we need to abstain from doing those kinds of things, putting our lives at unnecessary risk. We also need to help our neighbor see the same thing. We need to protect life, not put it at risk. Of course, if you try to help other people in, in whatever area you try to help them, you have to expect they're not necessarily going to like your help in that area. They might actually take it as an offense. I remember on one occasion, I... Um, I thought it would be a good thing to do to tell the secretary at the particular company that I was working at who was continually smoking all day long, do you realize that you're going to shorten your life by doing this? And how did she respond? Did she put out her hand and say, thank you very much for telling me that. Um, I'm going to quit right away. I didn't realize this was bad for my health. She just basically said, get out of my face. I've had so many people tell me this, I'm sick of it. Well, she later, of course, repented after that initial anger, and not, not truly repented, but she realized that I meant it for good. I just wanted to help her. And you know, she did die early from smoking cigarettes. It's bad for your health. Same thing's going to happen when you try to help people ultimately preserve their lives by sharing the gospel with them. Are they going to shake your hand for telling them? Well, some of them might, but others are going to get upset. They're going to get angry because you're telling them that they're in danger of going to hell and they need to repent and believe in Jesus and that doesn't reflect well on them. It doesn't make them feel good. But you need to tell them because it's true and they're going to perish without it. If we see our neighbors in danger from malnutrition, from exposure, from abuse from others, from life-threatening situations um, such as drunk driving, 
Uh, you know there's a, a lot going around uh, as far as uh, messages in the media about not driving and texting, not driving and talking and doing all these things because it's distracting and people die. Not, not driving drunk, the, the, the gal that died who was 29 years old was intoxicated. Um, ran right off, she was going that way, ran off the road, came all the way across and hit this, this tree. And now she's, she's gone. We need to do what we can to help people avoid situations that are dangerous. Now I think it goes without saying that we also should do what we can to protect the lives of the unborn as the Lord gives us opportunity to try to stop that because that is the unjust taking away of human life. It is murder. We also need to keep from hurting other people. The Sixth Commandment tells us that we shouldn't kill them, but it also tells us that we should not do anything that tends towards their harm. As I mentioned before, if you pop somebody in the face with your fist, you didn't kill them, but you've still broken this commandment because you've harmed them. You've done something that's taken away a measure of their life. Now they have to heal. Thankfully, they can heal, but it's still wrong for us to do that to injure them. Now again, self-defense is another matter entirely. We can use lethal force to stop somebody from, from killing us or killing somebody that we, you know, that's a neighbor of ours and so forth. We can certainly injure them to stop them. And uh, so it, we're not saying we can't do that. Now secondly, the Lord also calls us here to put away any emotions or words that can be hurtful to others. And here's where we get back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 22, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Well, at this point, the Pharisees are saying, Okay, I'm, I haven't committed murder, so I'm not liable to the court. But, Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the courts. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now what Jesus is telling us here is that there are other ways of breaking this commandment. There's other ways that we can injure people. And that is in our minds, in our hearts, and in our words. Even if we don't actually physically injure them, wanting to hurt them, you know, like this kind of thing. Wanting to kill someone. It isn't as bad as actually hurting them and killing them, but it's still contrary to the love that Jesus calls us to. I'm not going to kill you, but I sure like to kill you. See, we can't have that kind of attitude. It's the wrong heart. Now, we can also hurt others with our words. Jesus did talk about a couple of things. You might say, you good for nothing, you fool. Hateful words come out of a spiteful heart. There's a reason why you say those words, and if you say them and mean them, that means that you're hating your brother in your heart. You have this, this unrighteous, ungodly anger. And Jesus says that is a violation of the commandment. Jesus said to the Pharisees with regard to the connection between the heart and the mouth, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified. And by your words you will be condemned. There is a connection between what's in our hearts and what comes out of our mouths. And if what comes out of our mouths reveals a spiteful, hateful, vindictive heart, Jesus is saying, we have broken the spirit of this commandment by hating that person. The Lord wants us to love those who bear His image in the way that we speak to them, in the way that we treat them, in the way we think of them, not to hurt them. If we're angry at someone, if we become resentful or bitter, Rather than letting that spill out on them and others, we need to deal with the anger. We need to repent of it and put on love. Jesus says to us in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, 
You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing? What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the world says, don't get mad, get even. But the Lord says, don't get mad and don't get even. Instead, love your enemies and pray for them. Again, Jesus is our example. When he was hated by others, mistreated by others, and even nailed to the cross, on the cross, he did not cry out to his father, Father, destroy them for what they have done to me. But he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. He wants us to do the same. He says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. So rather than being vindictive, desiring you know, vengeance, judgment, retaliation, getting even, the Lord wants us even to protect uh, those made in his image in our minds, our hearts, our words, as well as our actions. The law of non-retaliation. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Because in so doing, you'll be doing what's right, and if there is something that needs to even the score, God will take care of it, won't he? So finally, where are we going to find the power to actually do this? The kind of love that we need to be able to treat other people this way. Well, we're not going to find it in ourselves. We're only going to find it in Christ. Now, if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you already have the ability to do this. You already have the power to do this. You just need to really yield to the Spirit of God, but you also need to pray and ask Him to give you more. That's what sanctification is really all about, is getting more of the Spirit, being more filled with the Spirit, and so having a stronger desire. Now, our Lord tells us on one occasion, if, if, if you being evil, and He was talking to His disciples, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. We just simply need to ask. And if we ask, believing that God will give us more of His Holy Spirit, He will give us more of His Spirit, and we will be able to do more of this, to treat others, protect others the way He calls us to do. We have the power to do this through Jesus Christ. He's given us the power to do everything He commands. Remember what Augustine said, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. He recognized that God had the right to tell him to do whatever he would have him to do. Luther said on one occasion that whatever God says to do is a good thing and I'll do it even if it seems completely irrational to me. And of course Luther in his, his own unique style said if God told me to eat the dung off the street I would eat it and know that it was good for me. <laughs> and we know a little bit more than that but still whatever God says, if he said that well, then we have to expect that it is good. Thankfully, he doesn't say that. But he does tell us to do certain things, and they are good for us. So, as Augustine said, Lord, you have the right to command what you will, but I can't do it, Lord, unless you give me that ability. And that's exactly what the Lord does through his Holy Spirit in the New Covenant when he writes this law upon our hearts. If you've trusted him, you have that ability, you have that desire, you yield to that desire and you ask God for a greater desire to do what is right. There is that part of it we must do, seek the Lord for his help. But if you haven't trusted him, you don't have this ability, but that's, this is where you need to begin. You need to begin by trusting Jesus because he's the only one that can give you this ability. You have to turn from your sins and believe 
and trust in Him. If you do this, He will forgive you. If you do this, He will reconcile you to Himself. The war between you and Him will end. But He will also give you the love that you need to be able to forgive others and to love even your enemies, to forgive them as He forgave you and to treat them in the way that Jesus treated His enemies. But only Jesus can do that. You need to trust Jesus. If you haven't trusted Jesus, then I would encourage you to do so this morning. And if you do, He will give you this power, the power of His Holy Spirit, to love and to protect those who bear His image. May the Lord give you the grace to do that. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to give us the grace to protect His image in the way that He's called us to do.